Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like I've been having a lot more connection with my listeners through the Q&As and polls. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Hi everyone, I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and welcome to A Catholic's Perspective. For those of you just finding this podcast, let me tell you a little about myself. I was born and raised a cradle Catholic until I fell away from the church for eight years. I just recently came back to the church and I could not be happier with where I am today. I am currently a junior in college and I'm studying graphic design. I am an ambassador for multiple amazing Catholic Christian companies and I love working with all of them. Now, some of you may already know me from my popular religious hippie social media channels, such as TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I have all kinds of Catholic content on there, so don't forget to go check those out. So the reason I wanted to start a podcast was so that I'd be able to have a longer format which people could listen to from wherever they are. I particularly wanted to address issues that young Catholics face today in the secular world, and I want to do that by providing information along with commentary and even a little of my own opinion. I can't lie, from time to time I might be discussing very controversial issues, and some will find my opinions unappealing. But I do this out of my faith and service to God. We must keep communicating with each other, respecting each other, and put each other on the path to sainthood. I think you'll enjoy the podcasts coming up, and I thank you for being here with me. Hey everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. Today, I wanted to talk with you guys about traditions, family, and responsibility. Here to discuss these topics with me is Hope Miller, a young pro-life activist whose goal is to educate the youth on the value and dignity of all human life. Welcome, Hope. Hi, thank you so much, Amber, for having me on here. I'm really excited to be on here with you. Um, Absolutely. Um, Yeah, so I have been a part of this movement my entire life. The pro-life movement is kind of my main focus. Um, With my grandparents being Joe and Ann Scheidler, I attended many events growing up. When I was about 13, I decided to really look into what this uh, fight was really all about and all that it entailed and what abortion really was. And with all this new knowledge that I gained, I knew I couldn't just sit idly by while this is happening in our great nation with God's children. So since then, I've become more active, taking on an independent role in this movement for the unborn. I love it. Thank you so much. So now that people know a little bit more about you, um, I think we're just going to really dive into this. I know we're going to hit on abortion a little further into this uh, podcast, but I really wanted to start off with um, the topic of family. So my first question would be, what traditional values do you see families lacking these days? Um, Well, this was actually something I was talking with my mom about earlier because I wanted to know what the uh, traditional family, what exactly set us apart from other families. And there were some characteristics that I started noticing were a big difference. First of all, um, the traditional families believe, not only believe in God, but they follow the religion and tend to be more strict with it. And then those families always have family traditions, which I still think that a lot of families nowadays still have, but the traditional families have uh, much more... I guess, heartfelt traditions, I suppose. Um, And then the other thing is that um, while many people celebrate, sorry, while many people uh, celebrate holidays, I also find that the traditional family, again, celebrates it in a more uh, family-centered way. So uh, talking about Easter, for example, um, it's more about the Easter bunny and egg hunting and everything like that. Uh, But 
a more traditional family would do would be going to mass on Sunday and then having a family brunch and then going to grandma and grandpa's for an Easter dinner. So mm -hmm. while they have similarities in the fact that they both celebrate holidays, they do it differently. Um, and just a few other things that I noticed is that they pray together, they value eating together as a family for dinner, sharing conversation, being open with one another. And then there's obviously the one mom, one dad, um, and then the children are expected to respect their parents. Um, so what I've noticed is kind of falling away from society is the first big one to me that I notice is um, the lack of respect that the children have for their parents which is uh, causing a lot of uh, rebellious uh, behavior, which is just detrimental to society. And one thing that I really notice in regards to not having respect for the parents is that the parents don't form this trust with their children. And so that when their children, for example, split up, slip up, uh, they feel like they can't tell their parents. And with that, we now have laws that allow 13 year olds to go get an abortion without par parental consent or even notification. So without that respect for the parents and the trust uh, between that bond, you're gonna have a lot of other issues in society. Yeah, absolutely. I think something you pointed on was the whole one mother, one father thing. And I see, especially in today's day and age, something that's very common is gender roles. Um, they're kind of erasing gender roles. And Definitely. unfortunately, because of that, <laughs> with the gender roles being combobbled, the parents are even confused on what their duty is individually as a parent. Right. Right. When you have these, when you have roles just in general blurred and it's now just a there's no line of uh, boundaries or rules or anything like that, you're gonna, yeah, of course, like you said, run into issues, whether that be gender roles or parent-children roles. I think roles are really important and underestimated. Absolutely, and I know the children even play a role in the family, yeah. you know, and if their parents are confused about what their role is, the children, it'll feed into the children, and many families right. These days, at least from what I see, they seem to be lacking in the virtues of humility and patience. Uh, I think that just comes from our modern day and age where we constantly are living in an evolving technological world where we get impatient quickly if something is not at the tip of our fingers, if something is not exactly how we like it. And I think that's really frustrating for some kids and some parents because parents expect their kids nowadays to just you know learn things be like this instantly be adults and they're not actually giving them the time to be children right yeah I totally agree with that 100%. so that's just really interesting so yeah I love your take on that and how do you think we can bring back the nuclear traditional family um, I was thinking about this earlier and I was trying to not be biased uh, <laughs> at work. <laughs> I'm just going to say it like I, uh, like I really think it is. Um, I believe that wholeheartedly that abortion is the root of all of, uh, all of our problems basically. And so when you take away, there's this bond between a man and a woman so powerful that it creates another life. And when you stop valuing that life, you stop valuing that love. And that's where you have same-sex couples and these other blurred lines, blurred roles. And if we were to restore the value in life, we'll restore that value between um, the bond between the man and the woman. And then there we'll be able to restore the nuclear family. Absolutely. And I know for a fact, it's like the family is the pillar of society. You take out the family, you take out society. Yeah. And yeah. I know for me, I think I totally agree with you. Abortion is definitely one of those foundations that's destroying our, our society, our family life. I think um, it's also important for people to get a sacramental marriage and to base their entire relationship and family upon God. I think that's the utmost important thing because when you do that, you totally eliminate that whole abortion issue to begin with because you automatically, um, you automatically, respect life because you were following God's commandments. Yeah. Um, 
for me, the second thing I would say is that there are many, many wounded people in the world today uh, who do not address their issues, addictions, and personal problems before getting into marriage. Um, and therefore the problems are kind of magnified in marriage and suddenly the marriage is crumbling because in marriage, your everything that is kind of like your downfall is magnified. Right. Not, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of little uh, things, you know, well, not little, but, you know, aspects that need to be um, basically brought back to uh, traditional in a more traditional way in order to I guess, bring back the nuclear family. So it was more traditional to be Christian Catholic. Um, it was more traditional to respect one another. It was more traditional for the man to lead the family. It was more traditional for the kids to be very respectful of the parents. So if we were to go back to, to traditional ways, we would also bring back a very strong family and society would have a very, um, it would be much stronger, less corrupt. Yeah, absolutely. So I think with all of that, it's like just bringing back those traditions would definitely help rebuild the nuclear family, you know, uh, and if you do have, you know, emotional, you know, personal life things, you should sort those out like debt, addictions, emotional problems, whatever. And before you get married, because you're bringing that into a marriage right. and father Ripperger, if you're familiar with him, um, okay. Yes, he is a Catholic exorcist. For those that don't know, you can find him on YouTube. He discusses how there's demonic obsession a lot these days. And basically, when the father can, commits a sin, that he can open the door for, I mean, demonic things, and it kind of affects the entire family. Oh. Yeah, there's this whole thing. And so, especially with, um, you know, abortion being so rampant in our society these days uh abortion has its own demon of course mm -hmm. and it's just very interesting to see how you know families can be um under so much spiritual warfare because the parents don't have their life together in a sense and they put yeah. their kids under attack right and yeah to bring kids in the world just to do that to them is yeah you're right unfair and so yeah i had never really looked at it that way before um and now that I am, it makes a lot of sense. And I bet that's a lot of reason for a divorce, which also destroys a family. So um, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, feeding off of like all of these societal problems, the downfall of the nuclear family has led to, in a sense, toxic femininity. And mm -hmm. do you think that um, toxic femininity is the reason why men are so afraid to take on the responsibility of being a father, a gentleman, a man. Um, yeah, I definitely think it has a toll on it. I think the problem is that, well, there's, there's a lot of problems with the modern day feminist movement, as you and I talked about on my, <laughs> on my podcast. Um, and so, um, the one thing I remember when I was looking at the questions that you sent me was that I think it was uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen said, there will not be a generation of gentlemen until there's a generation of ladies. Ladies are the ones who are supposed to hold the men accountable for their actions. Um, so when a, I mean, I know nowadays that like, if, um, and I keep seeing it on social media, like, oh, this wretched guy held the door for me. How dare he assume I can't do it myself. I melt every time a man holds the door for me. I think it's the sweetest thing ever. Um, I was out with my friends the other day and my guy friend just came over and opened my car door for me, even though I could do it by myself just fine. I think it's part of just being a gentleman and um, making the woman feel like she can do anything, but she doesn't have to do everything and let me help you with that. And I think that's okay. And so when the men are shamed for doing something so simple as holding a door, what makes you think that they're gonna wanna um, take on larger responsibilities? Um, if a woman thinks, oh, I can do anything, then a man's just like, okay, I guess you'll do it because they're not being held accountable. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it thinks of, uh, I, I think of this morning, I went to the gym at 6 a.m. this morning Ooh, and <laughs> I was walking to the front door and there was a gentleman ahead of me and he was clearly contemplating whether it was appropriate for him to hold the door open for me or if he should just go through it and I could see him like I was still walking and I was a little ways away. yeah and he was oh, just okay, good <laughs> he, he did he eventually did but he was just like 
kind of contemplating. He's like, should I, should I not? I hate that. I hate how they feel like there's one woman who's going to get offended if I don't open the door for her. And there's another woman who's going to get offended if I do open the door for her. And that's just not fair. Exactly. And it's just so confusing to the men. So men, I apologize. But I, when I, but he open eventually. The doors. Right. Okay. Please. Like you open the door, just, just leave. It's fine. You don't find a different girl. I, I don't <laughs> No, exactly. Because eventually. I, I reached the door and he was holding it open for me. And I said, thank you. And he almost looked shocked that I even acknowledged him for opening the door. And um, so it was, it's just kind of like that firsthand slap in the face of how toxic femininity has really kind of snuck its way into the minds of some of even the most chivalrous men, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think there's a difference between like, I'll, I'll be talking about a story or something like that. And I'll either refer to a man as a guy or as a gentleman, it'll depend. And I unconsciously do it. But when you act like a gentleman, I will refer to you as a gentleman. If you mm -hmm. act like a boy, I'm going to refer to you as a boy or a guy. It just, it'll depend, I guess. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, kind of piggybacking off of the whole responsibility and everything. Um, we're going to get into more of the abortion topic here. Do you think most people get abortions in order to get out of the responsibility, specifically men? Men? Yeah, probably. Um, mainly because the excuses people have for getting an abortion usually just affects the woman. Um, and so when a guy wants a girl to get an abortion, it's because he doesn't want to pay for the uh, child support or the child. He, is a, he doesn't even have maybe uh, intentions to stay with the same woman. Um, or maybe he doesn't want to have any ties to the same woman eventually down the line. I'm not sure. Uh, it'll, I guess, depend uh, by each individual. Um, but I think, yeah, the reason men would push for abortion is because they're trying to dodge the um, responsibility. That's not always the case for women. Women have different um, reasons. And I don't think that's fair to pin on women, but definitely in referring to guys, I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, prove me wrong. But I think when it comes to guys pushing for their girlfriends to get an abortion, it's because they want to get out of the responsibility of having a child. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, I, I haven't really had that much experience with male pro-choicers except for on the internet and when when I do have conversations with them most of their responses is like I'm too young to be a dad I don't want to be responsible for this like I don't have the time I don't have the money I don't have the facilities and you know it just makes me kind of think about saint joseph and how much he was willing to give up for yeah. our lady and baby jesus even though he knew he was not the biological father of jesus but even then he was willing to go to the ends of the earth for both of them and to you know really commit himself to god's will and you know children are such a blessing i mean our god came to us as a baby you know, who right. relied on humans in order for his care. I mean, two of the most virtuous, holy, graceful people ever to walk this earth, but he still relied on them. Right. And I so I think that just really reads into how important and special babies are. Right. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, the one one thing going back to our uh, kind of more gentleman topic real quickly, um, I'd have, what I've noticed is that... Um, traditionally, it is a men's obligation to protect women and children, especially mm -hmm. his family. And part of the problem of this toxic femininity where the men and women are seen as equals, um, not necessarily one leading the family or one being the head of the relationship or anything like that, is they're seen as equals. And so this man doesn't have the obligation to protect women and children. And that's part of the reason that men are for abortion because they don't feel this obligation to protect their child. And as a man, you should have an inclination to protect your child at all costs, mm -hmm. especially when it's life-threatening. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, that is a natural instinct for men. Again, going back to St. Joseph, when he was told to go into Egypt, Egypt was riddled with thieves and robbers and murderers. And he was risking so much going to Egypt to really save his family and to fulfill God's will. And I just think that if we really brought St. Joseph back, which it is the year of St. Joseph, yes, it, it, it would really help men understand their position and their responsibility as men. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, one thing, we had a uh, Crusaders meeting this past Saturday and we were doing debates and one topic that was brought up was um, you're, you're not, you're a man, you're never going to get pregnant, so you have no say, which honestly I find kind of funny considering they think women can be men and men can be women, but that's just <laughs> the point. Um, but they're like, you don't have a uterus, you don't have opinion, an opinion. And I think that's an unfair um, accusation to make, um, mainly because again, like I just said, it's um, a man's obligation to protect women and children. But now women are saying, well, if you don't have a uterus, you don't have an opinion, stay out of it. So again, they're gonna think, oh, well, I'll just stay out of it. I'll just back out of it. Sure, go get that abortion. Or they leave once a woman has a baby or they leave women. And it's so sad. And it's because women are saying, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't get a say in it. And so men don't feel like they're appreciated and or they don't have a responsibility and they'll leave. Right. And I think a lot of that comes from this whole, in a sense, like they're trying to divide us so much, but they're also trying to blur lines in certain areas. Right. It's like a weird kind of unity that is really just not working. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if you think about it, they're trying to blur the lines between men and women, you know, oh, you're non-binary or, oh, you're this or you're that, you can be whatever you want. So they're blurring that line, but then they come back and say, oh, you can't have an opinion on this because, well, you're a man, but then it doesn't apply to the, the bro choicers. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. I think it was you who, or maybe it was Anastasia who mm -hmm. posted it on their account. And it was like, um, what people think, um, like toxic femininity is, and it's like back in the day or whatever. And then it's like what it really is. And it's all these like basically, uh, trans pictures or gay pictures or something right. like that. And I think that's totally fair because there was a picture of like 12 men. It was really women. Um, and they looked like they were, on, um, on their, on their period, basically. Yeah. And I had somebody tell me that that was super transphobic of me to disagree with that. And I don't think that it is because they're saying, um, I'm a woman, I know exactly what I'm going through, this, that, and the other, you as a man got to stay out of it. But I'm still a woman, I still have a uterus, but I'm a man. Mm -hmm. it's blurring those lines of, okay, do you have an opinion or do you not? Because you're saying you're a man and you're saying men don't have an opinion, but you still have a uterus. So you do have it. It's just, it's, it's I very confusing. It's very confusing, yeah. especially for younger kids who are being indoctrinated yeah. into this stuff and not to mention, I mean, there's people like James Charles who decided to be pregnant for 24 that, hours. That was just I don't even know how to explain it. There is one thing that just um, really stands out to me there. Um, and I wanna take a second on it because uh, as a woman, what sets us aside for men is for the most part, there's a lot of things, but is our fertility. <laughs> and our fertility is the greatest gift ever given to a woman. I mean, Jesus literally saw it as so much of a gift that that's how he was gonna to come to this world. Mm -hmm. I've heard a story that the part of the reason the angels fell and didn't like God's plan was because of the fact that we could reproduce and the angels couldn't. That's probably just like a, a tall tale or whatever, but it's still kind of cool to think about that our fertility as a woman, myself, this is something so incredibly special. And these men are d taking it and joking about it and making something that isn't sacred or isn't unique to us women. I mean, it's not just a, a, the look of a pregnant belly like James did. It's not part of being gay at all. What it is, is that we are, our bodies are different, made different, and we can quite literally carry another human, create another human within our bodies. And that has been so degraded and there's no value to it anymore. And it's caused so many issues and blurred lines and confusion. And just, I mean, it's, it's very sad to see. Oh, absolutely. 100%. And going back to your angel thing, um, it is partially true. One of the reasons that Lucifer, you know, fell away and wanted to be his own God, so to speak, was because he knew God was going to create a virtuous woman free without sin who would actually have more grace and virtue than all the saints, all the angels combined. And so because of that, A, he didn't like women to him were, you know, Blech. so he has this like <laughs> hatred Rude. towards women yeah I mean it's Lucifer so yeah fair enough yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um he just hates women because of our lady and so you know how there's a, a demon that is attached to abortion um 
what's her name? It's something with an L again. Um, but mm -hmm. I remember um, hearing a story about this and um, oh my gosh, I can't remember her name and it's driving me crazy. Um, I'll remember. But yeah, you're right. And this was where the beginning of the abortion movement actually came into play was the, um, was this, you know, devil or demon or whatever started really saying she wanted to take away this beautiful gift of a woman and degrade it. And she succeeded. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, is that every single immoral thing that is pushed in our world is pushed by the Freemasons. People don't actually understand this, but when the Freemasons show up somewhere, abortion instantly starts showing up too. What are the Freemasons? The Freemasons are basically like this. They like to call themselves a fraternity, but a, it used to be back in the day, a Luciferian fraternity at the top, which basically meant that they believed they were their own gods. Mozart was a part, was it Mozart? Yeah, Mozart was a part of them and people think he was murdered by them. I don't know, that's a myth. Um, but now it's become a lot more satanic at the top um, where they actually are making blood vows to the devil and selling their soul and things like this. And they're very much into child sacrifice and evolution, which, you know, has been kind of debunked multiple times over and over again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you ever have the chance to do um, some a little background research, I wouldn't go too far into it, but at the top, it used to be Luciferian, now it's satanic. And I mean, Luciferian sounds satanic to me, <laughs> but what do I know? Um, but yeah, anyway, right, right. But they're the ones that whenever they pop up, abortion pops up, they're the ones that push the LGBTQ agenda. They're the ones that vote for the rights of gay marriage and all of that stuff they're literally committed to the destruction of the nuclear family and they know exactly where to hit they're basically marxists in a sense that's crazy i think it's so funny because i'll be debating with christians about abortion and there's you know i was saying you cannot be christian and and pro or pro choice i just mm -hmm. i don't think it lines up in any way shape or form um and i have you know a list of reasons for that and one thing I noticed was that I was listening uh, at the beginning of like the quarantine phase. My friend and I were listening to a podcast by, I think it was Zachary King. And one of his main things was how satanic abortion really is. It's mm -hmm. a satanic um, ritual, I guess. They'll put, you know, they'll get a bunch of girls pregnant just, just to abort the babies and, you know, throw the remains everywhere. It's absolutely terrible. So when you say you're Christian and pro-choice, I'm like, that doesn't, that doesn't add up. It's literally been proven to be satanic. Yes, absolutely. And you can't claim to worship a God of life and then go around and kill his children, his own creation. Yeah. That's not something you can do. Um, it can, it contradicts itself. And um, the thing is, is that abortion is actually a form of child sacrifice. You're sacrificing. Yeah. Oh, it definitely. Yeah. You're sacrificing your child for your own comfort and keep in mind that very, very, very few abortions actually happen due to cases of rape and incest. Oh yeah, definitely. The majority is because, well, they just don't want a kid. And so I think it's just really important to look at it through that telescope. Like the pagans used to sacrifice their children. You know, there was right. Satanists still do. They actually sacrifice their children and have these rituals where their kids get possessed it's insane oh, and yeah, so it, it's one of those things where it is actually child sacrifice and people don't right. view it that way because it's under the term of medicare or human rights no right. it's child right. sacrifice right. and it's eugenics right yeah no it definitely is and what i've also you know noticed through that is that um we cannot live in a culture that promotes selfish acts. If we want a strong, healthy culture, society, um, country even, we have to promote a culture of love. And you cannot love something if you're sacrificing other people for it. You should be sacrificing your, yourself by, like, for other people and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but you shouldn't force somebody else to sacrifice for you. That'll create a culture that's just so incredibly um, corrupt and harmful. And it's, you know, it's part of the reason we are where we are today. And we see so much hate in the world and why America is in such a tough place right now. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, we live in such a selfish culture right now. It's right. always just like, well, you offended me. You can't say that because you can't say that around me. And right. it's always about themselves. It's never about the other person. It's it's never like, um, you know, it, it's not like people can't it, respect each other. Right. And it's seen as the new norm is just you know, getting offended and you're disrespecting me. But how do you expect other people to respect you if number one, you don't respect yourself and number two, you don't respect other people? Mm -hmm. It just is not going to work. But the root of all of that, again, is that if you can't respect um, life at the very beginning, you can't respect it properly later on. It's physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever way you want to say it, it's impossible. Oh, absolutely. And I think it was uh, Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen who actually, I can't, specifically think of the exact <laughs> quote myself. <laughs> I can't think of the exact quote myself, but I know that he said, basically, I'm going to paraphrase here, paraphrase here. If right. a mother can sacrifice her child, what stops the child from sacrificing their mother when their mother is at their most vulnerable? Like euthanasia, basically. So if you have the- But now that's seen okay as okay now. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> um, the, what is that? Assisted suicide now? Yeah. They, that's what they're trying to put it under. Again, um, we're so broken because we're not in a culture of love that they're seeking out these terrible alternatives. In a way, I think that assisted suicide is another form of eugenics, but <laughs> that's just me. Um, but yeah, he basically told us like, if a mother thinks she has the right to kill her own child, their own child in the future is going to think it's their right to kill their own mother. And it's just this vicious cycle. Right. Or it goes back to bodily autonomy, which I was just talking about. Um, it cannot go so far as to harm another individual. So I'm all for my body, my choice. I can do whatever I want with our body, my body. God gave me free will to do whatever I please with my body. But here's the difference. You can't do whatever you want with your body if it harms another human person. Um, for example, you can't, you know, move your hand just so, so that you're stabbing somebody or you can't pull a trigger on a gun, even though you're doing whatever you want with your body, it affects another individual. You're harming another individual and there's ramifications for that. How is abortion any different? It is not your body. It's literally been scientifically proven that life begins at conception. It's a completely unique individual person just growing with inside you. And it's, it's not your body, your choice, even though, it is dependent on you, it doesn't mean that you have the rights to take away all of its rights, including its life. Absolutely. I totally agree. And so wrapping up here, um, how do you think we can, you know, fight for life under such a pro-death president? I know he's been reversing the Mexico City policy with that, and that's forbidden, you know, foreign organizations that receive U.S. aid from providing abortion services or abortion counseling. Plus, Biden has now reversed the Hyde Amendment, which bars, you know, Medicaid programs from funding abortion. So how do we continue this fight for life? I'm going to be completely honest. I'm awful with politics. <laughs> <laughs> you just said all that and I was like, whoa, really? I had no idea. Um, I think I watched five minutes of news while I was babysitting the other day. Um, <laughs> honestly, we, on, we got to keep just doing what we're doing. We can't, we're going to be shut off by the mainstream media at some point. They don't like hearing us. I know a lot of people have been censored. I mean, even President Trump has been completely censored, which is so against our free will rights or whatever. Um, but as Americans, we need to, you know, I love America. I want what's best for America. What's best for America is not a culture of death. So we have to keep going out and promoting a culture of life, whether that be sidewalk counseling or speaking or videos. I mean, anything you can do to help change this country to understand the value of all human life from conception until natural death. Next time we vote, we'll be able to vote in a president who's going to respect that, respect each other to the absolute fullest because we respected each other from the minute of conception. And once we have that level of respect, that solid ground of respect, we're going to be able to build a very strong society. And we can't do that until we restore the respect of the unborn child. So continue going out and doing whatever pro-life work you're able to do. And we need to change hearts and minds. And eventually we'll get to laws. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us, Hope. Really fast, how can people find you on social media? 
Right now, I'm just on Instagram. I hope to move to YouTube or something soon. But on Instagram, I'm Hope Miller04. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely go follow her on Instagram. And I hope this podcast was informative for you guys and maybe spark some ideas on how you might move forward as a Catholic in today's modern secularized world, you know, society. As always, you can email me at the religious hippie at gmail.com with questions, concerns, what you thought about this podcast, etc. And with all of that being said, I will talk to you guys in the next podcast. God bless. Do you have questions or comments about today's episode? Email me at thereligioushippie at gmail.com or leave a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash thereligioushippie. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to A Catholic's Perspective with Amber Rose, The Religious Hippie. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to like and follow The Religious Hippie on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, or visit her official website at thereligioushippie.com. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. And be sure to visit metatomics.org to see our listings of other unique podcasts.